Thanks, uh, Lori. And just uh, real quickly, I spent 12 years in the Florida legislature, ended up as a speaker of the House in 2000, 2002, spent six years in Congress. I was blessed to be uh, totally dependent on the most brilliant staff, uh, either in Tallahassee or Washington. And I know how dependent policymakers are on people in this room to turn great ideas into practical policy that can move uh, uh, the United States and, and your districts uh, forward. I currently am president and CEO of, uh, if not the largest, one of the largest state associations anywhere in the country called Associated Industries of Florida. We represent, amongst others, uh, the manufacturing uh, uh, folks with uh, the Florida affiliate of NAM. We have all lines of business. And so one of the things that I thought we would do today, because you're going to hear from Alan and Tim and Art that have a great deal of expertise in this particular policy that Lori uh, mentioned but also art from the big picture of, of, of uh, tax reform and how this can be done in a bipartisan way that helps with, uh, all Americans, as, as uh, JFK said, lifts all votes. The, um, the, the, the reinsurance uh, proposal in Florida alone, according to the Brattle uh, study that's about 10 years old, I think it's Alan that updated that for you, would cost businesses and individual consumers about 800 million <coughs> million dollars a year because of the depressed supply of worldwide capital. Florida is totally dependent on reinsurance, but your representative in your state is across all lines of business. If you think about the reason it's important to have global reinsurance, it's because the likelihood of a hurricane, we had five hurricanes within 18 months when the Jeff Bush was governor. But there is no correlation between the risk of, say, a nuclear disaster in Japan or a terrorist attack in London. So reinsurance spreads the risk in a way that makes capital more efficient. And as a consequence of, of the, the tax that uh, President Obama has in his proposed budget, um, uh, Congressman Neal and Senator Menendez, nobody, that your congressman, if you're a staffer for a congressman, if you ask people in a town hall, you know, I'm going to cut your taxes over here. I'm going to do these good things. Uh, is anybody opposed to me taxing offshore affiliated reinsurers? I've had lots of town halls. I wouldn't get one hand that objected to me doing that. But the practical implications, I'm going to let uh, both uh, Tim and, and Alan explain. I will tell you that the biggest challenge of trying to do good policy is a lot of unintended adverse consequences. You try to do the best thing you can in terms of a policy and legislative perspective. And it's also, it is it's almost always the unforeseen adverse consequences that are much more dramatic than maybe some unforeseen benefits. And so it's important that we recognize this would effectively be a 13%, in, $13 billion increase on the cost of consumers, depending on how exactly a proposal like this is structured. But there are other adverse consequences as well. Um, Congress has taken on a risk in flood insurance and in terms of risk insurance that probably there needs to be some federal role in. Uh, after 9-11, uh, I can tell you floods are very important to Florida, low-lying areas, uh, Louisiana, coastal states, but even the, the river 
uh, states. But having said that, we want to minimize the risk to American taxpayers as long as there's an efficient private market to take on that risk. And there is. It's a huge global market, but there are unintended consequences that not just will impact the economy adversely, which I think the following speakers will address, but also make it more difficult to do privatization of risk for terrorism risk insurance, for flood insurance, and for other things that this Congress is trying to do. I'll leave you with this, because even the most sophisticated business executives, I've talked about 20 of them, financial business executives, brilliant people with degrees like uh, Allen and uh, Art have from places like Yale, and I tried to explain a year and a half ago how the move to dynamic scoring or realistic scoring away from static scoring is so critical to getting the American economy again no matter what tax reform looks like. And no, none of these brilliant executives understood the difference between static scoring and dynamic, but I left them with a <coughs> real brief example. When Congress was trying to raise revenue during a period of short, extreme problems, it imposed a luxury tax. And it said, look, if we just dramatically increase the marginal rates of the cost of buying a Mercedes or a yacht, we can pay for other things. That sounded like a great idea, because almost less than 5% of my constituents were prepared to go out and buy a Mercedes or a yacht. The problem with that as a revenue raiser is that we immediately put a lot of American boat manufacturers, auto manufacturers out of business. We had a lot more people moving into the unemployment lines, failing to pay personal taxes because they were out of work. And so the luxury tax actually yielded dramatically less revenue than it was designed to do, even though it was politically popular with maybe 95% of your constituents if you had to do a pay for it. It's the same challenge we have right here. It's not good policy, but they pay for and your rules may uh, bind you. And then finally, I think Art Laffer will talk a little bit about what happened when, uh, you know, on a bipartisan, hugely bipartisan basis, uh, corporate tax rates were reduced, capital gains tax rates, and personal income tax rates. There was a terrible fear that the Treasury would dry up because you reduced all those rates on marginal taxpayers and investors. What really happened is that we almost doubled the net collection of federal revenue. So regardless of whether your priorities our transportation, our health care, or education, or tax cuts, which my businesses love, you will have more opportunity if you do rational policy to then fight over the spoils for tax cuts or expenditures that will make America a better place. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Hi there. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Alan Cole. I'm with the Tax Foundation. I'm an economist. I got my degree from Yale University. I spent some time as an actuarial consultant, though in the related field of pensions, not insurance. Um, and I've written a report on this particular proposal because we see it come up every so often, sometimes in, in um, proposed budgets, sometimes in proposed bills in the Senate or House. Um, and I'd like to just give some context for where this fits in in terms of the bigger picture on corporate taxes and talk a little bit about its economic effects as well. The first thing to think about is, well, when we talk about offshore things, when we talk about corporations being overseas, usually, um, regardless of what side of the political spectrum we're on, we start to ask, hey, are we doing something wrong here? Um, you know, for example, if autos are being made overseas, we wonder, could we be doing something better so that we could make those autos over here? Um, with the reinsurance industry specifically, um, that kind of hair trigger reaction to be worried about stuff being overseas is in fact um, maybe not so wise, and, and in fact it's closer to the opposite. As the congressman alluded to, um, the purpose of insurance generally as an industry is to spread risk around among a diverse group of people. Diversity is its strength, not its weakness. And therefore, having some risks from the United States being spread to places other than the United States is in fact a feature, not a bug, of the industry as it exists now. Um, 
historically, there have been a few instances of um, disasters that were so large that it would have been a problem for the United States to just fund all of the relief by itself. Um, there have been several um, large hurricanes in the last 15 years or so. Um, and there's also concerns with terrorism or um, flooding. And for all of those, um, if one house in the United States is doing badly, maybe a lot of them are. And in that case, it's useful to have this nimble, powerful system for international disaster relief. Now, um, this proposal specifically would change the corporate tax base for a very specific industry in a kind of ad hoc way. Um, and there are a couple of reasons I, I don't like that very much. The, the first thing is that we, we've all agreed in tax policy we want everyone to kind of pay the same rate. That's a principle of how we do things. It's also important to have a consistent definition for the base. And one of the ways that we think of defining income is usually, well, it's your revenues minus your expenses. Um, if you want to levy a corporate income tax, that is what corporate income is. And what this proposal would do is say, let's just ignore reinsurance expenses. And to be <laughs> fair, they also ignore the claims that you get back from a reinsurer, um, supposing that um, you need them. So in effect, it, it says um, the corporate income tax will take into account all of your transactions except this one, which it will sort of just not recognize. Now, there's some reason to um, have the IRS <coughs> not recognize transactions if they are legitimate, and the IRS, in fact, has the authority to do that. Um, if a company were to make a tra transaction that they didn't think was a real legitimate business purpose, then um, the IRS actually has some abilities to void those, and that's a large area of tax law. But that's not what this is, and that's why um, people are looking to legislation instead. Uh, the problem with that perspective is that these really are real legitimate business transactions doing exactly what they're supposed to. Uh, and to ignore them in this specific case kind of raises the question of, of where are you going with the corporate base? Are you going to make ad hoc adjustments to every single industry? And um, if so, um, well, you'll probably see me on a lot more panels talking about stuff like this. <coughs> and we'll have lots of um, intra-industry squabbles over whose tax base gets defined as what. And that's not a very productive way to be going. You should instead stick to a consistent definition. Um, the other thing that I wanted to get to, um, part of the contents of my report is on what happens when you levy a tax on the capital stock specifically. Um, reinsurance is all about the capital stock, the capital stock being the literal physical assets that we own in um, places where they might need insurance, you know, places like Florida. And um, if you were Deciding to create a new asset, um, a new house, a new building, a new piece of equipment, um, the insurance premiums that you pay would be part of that. Um, that would be part of your decision making process. And um, the insurance premiums you pay are affected by the um, financing that the insurance company can get for reinsurance because most insurers buy some sort of reinsurance uh, insurance for insurers. Now, um, if your premiums are higher, well, eventually that has to have an effect somewhere. The money has to come from somewhere. And um, if you imagine that people just spend the same amount, which is what our model does, if you imagine people spend the same amount on things like their um, business capital stocks, their, their buildings, their stores, their houses, then eventually that little increase in the reinsurance premium 
starts to chip away at the capital stock. This proposal, by my estimates, results in about a 0.3% <coughs> increase in the cost of maintaining an ongoing investment. Now, that's not very much at all. Um, that's not a big thing in, in you know, Washington terms, where we're talking about hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. But it's just enough that a tax that doesn't really raise much revenue might lose some of that revenue back. So if, if you're talking about a tax raising, um, say, a billion dollars in its first year, um, that 0.3 increase in the service price of capital is ultimately going to reduce the private business capital stock by about $7.8 billion. There are a lot of um, business capital investments that are reinsured. And the household capital stock by about $2 billion. So the value of all of the stuff that we own is about $10 billion down. And that has enough of an effect on GDP to make the tax revenues look a little bit worse instead of um, a billion dollars, you'd raise only about two-thirds of that. And um, right now, under the traditional methods of scoring tax bills, we can't take into account these sorts of effects. Um, <coughs> we haven't historically, but we're looking at doing that in the future in Congress. And um, if you were to even make a fairly conservative assumption on the capital stock of tax that raised 10 billion over 10 years um, is going to result in something like a $10 billion decrease in the total capital stock. And we should be mindful of levying taxes on the best possible base, and this is probably not it. So instead of looking to these little piecemeal industry by industry changes, um, some of which may not be that well thought out, Instead, we should look to broader business tax reform for everyone with a consistent base. Thanks. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Again, my name is Tim Kieber. <coughs> I'm a partner in the International Trade Group at Mayor Brown Law Firm. Uh, and prior to that, I was the Chief of Staff of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, I'm going to talk about the international trade aspects of it, but let me just start off by talking how I initially came to start working on this issue. Um, I had a, a friend who was working on this in the tax space, and it traditionally had been a, a, a tax fight, and he had a lot of experience in the trade world, and he noticed the name of the group that is pushing this is, and it got a website, you can see, it's called Coalition for Domestic Insurance Industry. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say coalition for ubiquitous, plentiful, inexpensive reinsurance that's good for consumers, right? It's about the domestic U.S. insurance industry. And from the trade world, that sort of set off the spoke signals about what this is really about. It's not about protecting the U.S. tax base. It's not about um, uh, tax evasion. It's pure and simple protectionism. It's about throwing up a barrier at the border for um, domestic providers. And um, I think uh, Dr. Laffer probably coined the term, if you tax something, you, you get less of it. And I think it's um, undeniable that, that that's what you have here. And you know, normally the, you know, the, the, a topic like international trade law, reinsurance, and tax law might easily put you to sleep. But this is real world implications. I mean, if you think about the types of events and disasters that reinsurance is used for, that, um, that global reinsurance is used for, terrorist attacks, large hurricanes, oil rigs blowing up, airplanes blowing up. I mean, these are enormous events that require huge sums of money. And if you have reinsurance that is that the supply that gets constricted, is more expensive, by definition, you're going to have the, uh, less business, less economic activity that touches a whole lot of sectors of the economy. So, the topic can be dry, but it, it really is have real world uh, policy implications. So, um, the biggest problem from my perspective with these proposals is they violate U.S. World Trade Organization obligations. The U.S. Uh, committed to open up its insurance and reinsurance markets uh, to be 
served by foreign providers on a both cross-border basis and by uh, commercial presence within the U.S., essentially foreign subsidiaries. And <coughs> this proposal um, blatantly violates it. Uh, I'll, I'll talk also about how it exposes the U.S. to the risk of significant retaliation by uh, other WTO members, large trading partners like the EU and Switzerland, and also how the current tax code actually already has an existing tax to get at whatever um, base erosion risks uh, there are. Very quickly, in WTO ob obligations, this violates U.S. obligation to provide national treatment. National treatment means you cannot treat foreign providers worse than domestics. The U.S. in return gets treated the same way overseas. So it's, it's, it's a mutual benefit. This tax applies only to uh, foreign-based affiliate reinsurers. It does not apply to any U.S.-based reinsurers. That right there ends the question of whether there's actually discrimination based on nationality. The other side has argued, oh, this is just about taxes. It's not about um, whether a company's foreign or domestic. And that, that on a fact basis, that just belies uh, that argument. There is an exception to the services rules in the WTO that does allow you to discriminate if the purpose is to neutrally secure the tax base. As I mentioned, this, would, this, this, this proposal, if it, it was actually drawn up in a way that was targeting potential for base erosion, it wouldn't be drawn up this way. This essentially takes uh, a, a gun to, to foreign providers. Um, it makes no attempt to distinguish between what is the ordinary business of reinsurance, which is essentially taking reinsurance from a bunch of different areas, insurance from a bunch of different areas, and reinsurance insuring into one pool as Alan described, and usually it's done by what regardless of US or foreign companies, where your home base is, and that's frequently where the, the, the capital gets pooled. Um, so if one were to actually devise a test to go after what might be the potential for uh, neutral security in the tax base, that would be the first question. If you don't have a real test that says what is the business of insurance and what might be done for uh, tax motivated reasons, um, then, then you're not really interested in, in, in protecting the tax base, you're just protecting, interested in, in closing down the, the foreign company competitor. Um, a lot of these proposals also provide for an election, and proponents say, well, you can elect to be treated like a U.S. company, and then there's no discrimination, so any discrimination in the main provision uh, is cured by the election. But in fact, this actually exacerbates it. I mean, the simplest way I think about it is, if um, somebody gives you the <coughs> choice uh, that you get an election to get uh, a gun to your head or a bat to your head, the bat may, you may choose to have the bat taken to your head, that doesn't make it any less of an assault. Um, and essentially, that's what this has, does here. It would require these foreign reinsurers who are just providing a cross-border service to pretend that they're a U.S. business and suddenly you have to file with the IRS and be investigated by the IRS. And everybody <coughs> argues that those two things alone don't uh, are in a significant change based on what we've seen the past few years. I think, again, the, the facts just um, belie it. And even the election would subject these companies to uh, uh, effective tax rates 100% higher than, than their U.S. counterparts. Um, well, some of the more recent proposals had a, a supposed fix for the issues I've described that would say if on that transaction you paid uh, a higher effective rate than the top U.S. marginal rate, then you, the tax doesn't apply. I saw a lot of eyebrows just get rise when I, when I mentioned that. Well, those are that's an apples and oranges comparison. And there's plenty of uh, other uh, aspects of the U.S. tax code, whether it's federal bonds that aren't taxed, so very few companies actually pay the top marginal rate. Um, you could easily have a situation where a foreign provider was actually paying a higher, the, the effective rate was higher than the top U.S. marginal tax rate, and they'd still get whacked uh, with this tax. So I think if this is enacted, um, it would chill you know, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars worth of international trade. Uh, WTO would, would authorize um, retaliation based on that amount. That's potentially billions of dollars in trade sanctions. That's bigger than anything that the WTO has actually authorized in the past. Uh, 
this is not just me, a, a you know, a, a, client, a lawyer with, with, a, with a client. The EU Trade Minister and um, Financial Services Minister have written to U.S. counterparts multiple times over the past few years, saying this violates your obligations. If you do it, there will be consequences. Uh, so it would very much put uh, U.S. service exporters not only in the insurance industry but in other sectors at, at risk. And uh, even as Alan described it, the way it operates, it, 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 is, it violates the what has been a tenant of U.S. international tax law policy, which is very clearly would end up double taxing um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of these profits to the extent there are profits. And let me let me go back to the, that issue. A key point of insurance. Um, is that these are real market, uh, arm's length market based transactions. So you're not shifting or stripping profits out of the United States. You're uh, moving premium, and, uh, you're, you're obtaining premium, and you're, you're sending the risk overseas. You don't know in insurance what, what where the disaster is going to happen. It's not insurance if you actually know in the, in the first place. So you could be sending losses overseas. Uh, you could be setting profits. That's the whole point. There's actuaries who try to figure it out beforehand, but that's the whole point. And when large disasters hit, the insurance industry ends up having losses. Um, finally, uh, there's an existing long-time federal excise tax on foreign insurance premiums. It's 1%. 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 1% applied to premiums. It's a 1% tax on revenues, not on profits. So again, if you have a large disaster event, uh, you could have losses overseas that would have been taxed at 1%. If you have very thin uh, margins, it ends up being a 1% tax could be much more high, <coughs> higher effective rate than the US uh, corporate income tax. Uh, it, so this is not a new discussion. This has been around uh, since at least the 1920s, I think. And the US actually negotiated in the WTO a specific carve out for that 1% uh, federal excise tax. Um, essentially, what the domestic industry has been arguing is that the 1% tax on foreign reinsurance isn't enough. There's still too much competition from uh, foreign providers. That's exactly what the U.S. is not allowed to uh, sign up for. And, and, uh, and if it did, the consequences would be very severe. So with that, we turn it over to Dr. Lappert. Thank you, Arthur Lappert. Uh, can you all hear me? Great. Let, let me, if I can, let me get all of you here. It's a delight seeing all of you and how young all of you are and the future of America, about all that, um, if I can. The, when you look at these tax issues, if, if you don't behave honorably, who does? And when you look at these little, deep, these little proposals through here, it's up to you to really make sure bad things don't happen. If you look at this proposal, uh, whether it's Alan or Tim's comments, I mean, it, it, equal treatment. All expenditures should be treated equally if you're going to do the calculation. I think it's a stinking, awful corporate tax code. But this is the one we have. You should treat all expenses equally. This, of course, would differentiate amongst expenses, as you pointed out, Alan. Uh, if you look at GAP or uh, WTL, this would treat foreigners differently than it does Americans. These are no-brainers. The, the one I get that really really gets to me is it violates every principle of economics you want. What you're going to take is this little bit portion, a little tiny tax base, it's the expense, and put a 35% tax rate on it. So you have a very high tax rate on a very small tax base, which it violates every principle of economics you want. You always want the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. And, and then it, there's one other thing that just goes here, and, and to me, there's just no, there's no cure for stupid. When you look at this legislation, these people all, all say we've got a pay-go obligation to find revenues to pay for other things. Pay-go is wrong. <coughs> you know, it is not right to use static revenue neutrality uh, to calculate what the revenues will be to match up for expenses. If that were true, why wouldn't we raise the corporate tax to 250%? on all corporate profits, then we could have a lot of revenue to be able to fund everything. Duh. You have to have dynamic scoring in this. And if you look at what the rules are for this legislation, 
It is really a pago, and that is the only argument you hear people using as to why we should do this tax, but we need the revenues for some other procedure. And that is the wrong model. This is a no-brainer. It's, it, it's, really, it's really a false issue that is obviously wrong. And you guys are the ones who have to make sure your bosses know that and that you don't let it get through. Because these things come flipping back on you. And I've been around this, this town a long, long time. And the accumulation of little bad policies really adds up to destruction of the country. And, and I want to come back to you because if you guys do this sort of stuff, you take away the really getting the dream of what could be. You know, I'm going to quote Bob Marley for you. Those who are trying to make the world worse never take a day off. How can we? When you look at the reason why someone would propose this, it is the most violent, vulgar, anti-competitive motivations that these people are using to propose something like this. You guys have to be the people who block it and stand, and stand at the gate and pray. And, and I want to take you a, a step further in this, too, because we're going to get changes in the political structure. And, and the dream is really to make a corporate tax structure where we can create a big problem in the United States, not a little one. I'm going to take you back in time. The dream, the dream really here, is to get a corporate tax structure that collects your revenues in the least damaging fashion and provides for the expenditures in the most beneficial fashion. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not liberal. It's not conservative. It's economics is the operation. Let me take you back in time to Truman and Eisenhower. Uh, we had a tax rate in the United States of 91%. We had a 52% corporate tax rate. Uh, this was Eisenhower, Nixon, and Truman. Uh, a young, fresh president came in, a guy named John F. Kennedy. He came in with the tax reforms you may know. He cut the highest marginal income tax rate in America from 91% to 70%. He cut the corporate rate from 52 to 48%. He tried to cut it to 46%. But thank God, Barry Goldwater and all the Republicans locked together and blocked it from that irresponsible move. Bob Dole, back then, voted against cutting the highest tax rate from 91% to 70% because we couldn't afford the revenue losses. If that's not the stupidest pay go thing I've ever seen in my life, that was it. If you look at what happened with Kennedy, we also put in the uh, Kennedy round tariff negotiations. If you look at what happened, we also did accelerated depreciation. Uh, you know, all of these policies, and we had the go-go 60s, an enormous expansion of prosperity in this country. You know, if you look at Harding and Coons, the same thing. I mean, we had Cox and Roosevelt were running in 1920. They were the hand-picked people of Wilson who put in the income tax, who put in the Fed, who did all sorts of damage to the economy, all sorts of rotten behavior uh, of the U.S. economy during the Wilson administration. Then you get Hardy and Coons came in. They won the election in 1920 by the largest percentage ever. They, they cut the highest tax rate in America from 77% to 25%. Is that a good enough cut rate? The period was called the Roaring Twenties. Uh, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners went through the ceiling as a share of GDP. You know, we had this huge prosperity. Then you've got the, then, then you've got the um, um, Reagan period. I mean, you, you know, Reagan, we followed what I like to call the four students. Uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, forgive me for those of you who are, love those people, but I used to call them, it's the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. But we did if we cut the tax rate. Let me take you through the tax plan. I mean, if you look at the tax plan with Reagan, ultimately we got the highest tax rate in America, and I'm going to go through the 86 Act with you. We cut the highest marginal income tax rate from 50% to 28%. Is that a good, a good enough cut for the fat cat Richies? Hmm? You, you agree with me, huh? In case we missed a few, we didn't get enough fat on it. Uh, we cut the corporate rate from 46 to 34%. You know, by that time, by the way, in that day, that the 34% was the lowest rate in the world. Everyone else has copied us, and so now it's the highest rate. We're 35 now. But, you know, what else did we do? We raised the lowest rate from 12.5% to 15%. We took it from 14 brackets down to two brackets, 28 and 15%. Uh, we got rid of all these deductions, exemptions, and exclusions, all right, to make it exactly revenue neutral. What the president said was if this raises 100 bucks, he's going to veto. If it costs 100 bucks, he's going to veto. This is not about raising or lowering taxes. This is about changing the structure of the tax codes. You know, when you look at that, just to remind you of the vote, just to tell you what good economics is, it's not partisan. 
the 86 Tax Act passed in the Senate, at least, by 97 to 3. Think of it. Could you imagine that bill today dropping the highest rate from 50 to 28, dropping the corporate rate and raising the lowest rate? I mean, you couldn't, what, get two votes maybe? Bipartisanship and pro growth, the dream, is what we're all after. We are coming into an era. Jerry Brown, in 1992, ran on getting rid of all federal taxes. All of them, except for two flat rate taxes, one on business net sales, and one on personal unadjusted gross income. Very few deductions, exemptions, or exclusions in any of these. Replacing the personal income tax, the corporate tax, replacing all payroll taxes, both employer and employee, replacing the Medicare, Medicaid tax, replacing all excise taxes, getting rid of the death tax, getting rid of the under income tax, all of these things. The only thing he kept was sin taxes, because their purpose is not so much to raise revenues as it is to change behavior. It's a very small percentage. And he instead, he wanted two 13% flat rates, one on business net sales, and one at 13% on personal unadjusted gross income. That was his proposal. The first serious presidential candidate in modern times to run on eliminating the progressivity of the tax base. He went from eight to the noise. When he entered the race, there were eight candidates, and he was number eight in the poll. And he was the, uh, the Jim Gilmore. He was, I don't know if you know Jim Gilmore's running for president, too. He's not polling very well. He was the Jim Gilmore uh, of the race there. In fact, he, he called me. Uh, he said, I did something really stupid, Art. I said no one could contribute more than $100 to my campaign, and I'm in real trouble. We need a Hail Mary. That's when I did this tech. We went from eighth in the race to second in the race. Not only were we second in the race, but we were coming into New York. And this is a Democratic primary, by the way, with a true black tax. We're coming into New York, and we're closing in on Clinton. It's a 92 primary. I mean, we are closing in. We, we've got him. We're going to win this race. When he announces Jesse Jackson is his running mate. Um, I, I don't really think Jerry wanted to be president, but he loved him. But we got the second most number of delegates. These things can be done. They are by, you look at Clinton. I mean, everyone talks about Clinton's tax increase, but come on. Let's be serious. Clinton pushing after through Congress against his own party, against the unions. You've got to take your hat off Clinton for that. Clinton got rid of the retirement test and Social Security. It used to be. That, uh, uh, that when you hit the age of 65, if you earned any income, you lost, for every dollar of earnings you got, you lost 50 cents in Social Security benefit. It was called the retirement. He got rid of that. Clinton uh, signed into law welfare reform. The idea that you actually had to work for a job to get welfare. I mean, there, God, how unfair of Clinton also signed into law the biggest capital gains tax cut in our nation's history. Cut the capital gains tax rate from 20% to 15%. But not only that, Clinton exempted all owner-occupied homes from ever paying capital gains tax. Again, federal, state, and local. I mean, this is an amazing feat there. If you want to really look at Clinton, look at government spending as a share of GDP under Bill Clinton. It fell like a stone. It fell by more than the next four peacetime presidents combined. You know, this is a pro-growth agenda that was done Republican and Democrat. You can see the prosperity under, under Clinton there. Uh, you know, what I want you to do is I want us to not do this little petty stuff on the tax with others. Dishonorable, and it's wrong. What we need to do is go for a bipartisan dream of creating a truly efficient tax code. You know, there are two types of incentives in this world. They're positive and negative incentives. But by way of illustration, if you feed a dog, you know exactly where that dog will be at food time, right where you fed it. That's a positive incentive. Positive incentives tell you what to do. Negative incentives tell you what not to do. If you beat a dog, you know where the dog won't be, but you have no idea where the dog will be. Negative incentives tell you what not to do. Uh, don't put your hand on the hot stove. The stove could care less where your hand is as long as it's not on it. Okay, negative. The tax codes are negative incentives. They tell people what not to do. Do not report taxable income. They don't tell you how not to report it. Evasion, avoidance, underground economy, moving to a different location, whatever it is, by the way, going out of business. So what you want to make sure you do with the tax codes is you have the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. So you provide people with the least incentives to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income, and the least places to which they can escape. We all know that taxes are bad. They are bad. I mean, the reason we tax speeders is why? To get them to stop speeding. 
Why do we tax cigarette smokers? To get them to stop smoking. Why do we time tax people who work? Why do we, we don't do it to get them to stop working. So therefore, you want to make sure you do the least disincentives there. And that's where we want to go, corporate tax reform in the next stream. So don't get into this stuff and don't allow people to be, behave badly and corruptly. We've got to go to the big dream of really trying to bring us all together to make this thing happen. I have never been more optimistic today than I am. Uh, I, I, I was there in the 1970s. I remember I've been to this barbecue before. Uh, in the 1970s, I knew something was happening that was really exciting. I didn't know what it was. Now I do. And you guys are on the cusp of a revolution. And what I beg you to do is please don't let your bosses, don't you personally, get into this type of corrupt legislation and do the things correctly. And what we need to do is then fight for the goal. I'm very proud of a number of the Democrats today who have talk, called me and talked to me about what we can do working together on good economics. And you guys are the vanguard. You guys are the people standing at the gates. If you don't stop it, who does? Well, I, I want to stop here, but the moral responsibility rests very strongly with all of you to do the right thing. And don't let some, well, I'm just going along with Pago. Pago's wrong. It's terribly wrong. You've got to be correct on the economics. And this type of nonsense is the exact type of thing we don't want to have. So let, let me just stop there. And you can maybe go to questions or whatever you want. So once again, just as a reminder, please state whatever protest statement you have in the form of a question and keep it concise. And given that we are recording, if whoever your question is directed to, if you guys can sort of repeat it back a bit from the microphone to make it clear for the tape what was asked. Do we have any questions? Wonderful. Um, any thoughts on the IRS's um, regulations um, to address folks using overseas reinsurance companies to the base, um, the base um, as opposed to the legislation. Right, sure. IRS. So uh, I think what you're talking about is some IRS rules with respect to hedge funds and reinsurance. And, um, it's, it's, it's fundamentally a different issue. The, the big question there is, are these entities actually the business of reinsurance? Uh, and what's the percentage of reinsurance? Um, uh, some, as I have read, that you know, there's, there's the reinsurance business is one or two, or very low percentage of the overall business, but they're classified as reinsurance is where they're, they're located. Again, that's not an issue I've tangentially looked at, but that's fundamentally different from this, which would clearly hit uh, all, uh, all, all reinsurers. Um, that, that particular issue is much more a narrow target. So, do you think that's a better approach? To well, absolutely. I think the IRS could use its existing, as Alan mentioned, they've got uh, existing authorities to uh, to go after transactions if they're not uh, done with a, a business purpose. And sorry, one more reminder: if you could just say your name and where you're from, that would be great. Also, are there other questions? If I could just add, um, the IRS authority to handle what they deem to be um, suspicious transactions. It's U.S. Code Section 162, and the key is that a business expense that is deducted needs to be both ordinary and necessary for doing the business. And the thought is that this applies to reinsurance because that's kind of the point. And um, it, that's why it would take a legislative change to actually give the IRS the authority to go after reinsurance more broadly. Can, can, can I just mention uh, something now we've heard from the experts? Um, you know, this is a trick question. Uh, whether you are suffering from uh, the aftermath of an earthquake in California, a terror attack in uh, New York, floods in Louisiana, or hurricanes along the East Coast, how much does a $50 billion event cost? Ultimately, the cost of repair is paid by somebody. In Louisiana, we had a disastrous economic response because so many of the property owners there during the floods were uninsured. The federal government 
by default became the insurer of last resort, and it was the most inefficient way from an expense perspective ever to rebuild a city. Extremely expensive. Insurance markets are very efficient at making sure that repairs are done. I can tell you I'm sad about this. Uh, you know, we love promoting, in my organization, Florida as a place to do business. Rick Scott is competing all the time with Rick Perry to see who's got the better set of uh, dynamic economic policies. But the one thing Florida does worse than any developed rational market in the world is we concentrate the risk of our insurance because it's politically unpopular to try to shift the risk to the private sector. Florida, by the way, has the, large, the largest property and casualty insurer in our state is basically the state government, a group called Citizens. The largest reinsurer is the state government. Now, having insurance paid by future taxpayers or, or people who will have to have increased rates, it works great. It's very cheap until you actually have any debt. Florida has the worst in the, in the entire, not just free world, China has a better reinsurance risk allocation. And so I would just suggest that one of the things you do is you think about this reinsurance affiliate proposal. Ultimately, the federal government is going to end up likely coming in and repairing an enormous inefficient expense, a disaster, whether it's terror, earthquake, nuclear attack, uh, or, or flood, or, or hurricane. You can do yourself a lot of harm in trying to limit the damage to future taxpayers if you try to offload the risk. There's capital all over the world that's very efficient that would love to diversify its risk. There's no correlation between the likelihood of a, of a, of a flood in the Mississippi or an earthquake in California or a terror attack in Chicago or a nuclear disaster in, in Japan. And so risk spreading and diversity provides for a much more efficient way on the front end to pay. And again, the trick question is, how much does it pay to fix a $50 billion debt? Somebody pays at least $50 billion, and if the federal government has to do it, it's probably twice that. Do you have any other questions? We probably have time for one more, so you can wrap your brain. All right, great. So we've talked a lot about Florida. I don't know if you have thoughts on other states, because we have a wide variety of offices that are um, here. So, whatever states can it really matter? Yeah, so to explain why it's such an important interest to the Florida business community, if you're any of the coastal states, um, California has a huge uh, earthquake uh, liability. You just never know when an earthquake is, is going to hit. Uh, again, uh, flooding. So, the total cost, according to the Brattle study from the Wharton School of Economics uh, professors, about uh, 10 years old now. An estimate of a version of this proposed tax is it will cost consumers around the country, in every state, more money, something on the order of uh, $13 billion annually. So it's an annual increase in the cost because you depress the supply of availability. All of your states are uh, affected. Um, and by the way, it's not just property and casualty insurers that buy reinsurance. If you think about uh, somebody that does uh, windshield or auto insurance, you can predict the likelihood if you have 100,000 policyholders in, uh, in, in, in Chicago or, or, uh, uh, or, or Dallas, Texas, uh, in your auto portfolio. What you can't predict is when a hailstorm is going to come in and damage 30% of the 100,000 cars you have. That's why catastrophic insurance allows all primary insurers, workers' comp. Think about what happened in the aftermath of 9-11, life insurance, all sorts of risks that really smart, sophisticated primary insurers have are taken and allocated so that you can diversify the, the, the risk. All of your states are impacted. They're all impacted by dramatic costs in, um, in, in interest. But here, I'll go back to the first question I asked. Politically, do you have to find a $13 billion a year paid for, give or take? Well, if I had a town hall meeting and asked people, well, I can do these three or four goodies for you, all sorts of promises and Christmas tree, but I'm going to have to raise taxes on offshore affiliated reinsurance. Anybody have an objection? I would have had 100 votes leaving that room until the storm hit or until the cost of their primary insurance went up. And it's one of those hidden things that is, uh, you know, uh, Art and Tim and Alan have said, you don't necessarily see the impact of these things, but you add them together and you end up with what we have in the U.S. tax code, which I don't know anybody that supports the United States tax code as it is. So, 
and then we'll wrap it up because I don't think I could actually give a better closing statement than that. Um, and we do have to be out at one for the next event. So thank you all very much for coming. Please grab some extra food on your way out. Um, feel free to email us at the Art Street Institute with any questions you might have, or you can feel free to chat with the panelists in a brief few minutes we have before.